monthly Lotus Sutra study series this month. This month we are studying uh, chapter 14, Peaceful and Agreeable Practices. And as we always do, we begin with a short recitation um, from the chapter itself. And I would invite everyone to please feel free to join me in this. They will roam everywhere, fearless as lion kings, the radiance of their wisdom will shine like the sun when the buddha knows that their minds have deeply entered the buddha way he will give them the assurance of attaining the highest perfect awakening they will also dream of themselves in mountain groves, training themselves in good practices, experiencing ultimate reality in its many forms, entering deep meditation, and seeing themselves encountering the Buddhas in the ten directions. Those who expound this foremost Dharma will gain great benefits. Ah, thank you. Chapter 14, Setting the Scene. We see here two beautiful statues of Manjushri riding on a lion and Samantabhadra riding on an elephant. And Manjushri uh, in translation means gentle glory. And the chapter begins with Manjushri asking the Buddha how to teach in the evil age to come. And the Buddha replies, Manjushri, this Dharma Flower Sutra is the foremost teaching of the Tathagatas and the most extremely profound of all teachings. It is the last of all to be given and I now give it to you. Just like that powerful king at last giving away the bright pearl that he has guarded and kept for such a long time. Manjushri, this Dharma Flower Sutra, the hidden treasury of the Buddha Tathagatas is supreme among all sutras. I have guarded it and protected it throughout the long night never recklessly proclaiming it on this day for the first time i reveal and expound it to you um, manjushri is also known as manju shosha which means gentle voice and he was particularly known for wisdom and awakening for this man manju gosha actually oh thank you Sorry michael that. yeah and he's riding on a lion carrying the sword of the Dharma, the sword of wisdom that cuts through all illusions. And the lion, of course, the roar of the lion, Nietzsche used this metaphor quite often, that nothing can withstand the roar of the lion. And Manjushri is often seen as near equal to the Buddha, and some even said he was a Buddha, but he was just deliberately being a bodhisattva to support the Buddha in his practice. And you guys may remember that the beginning of the Lotus Sutra, when the Buddha emits a, a shining ray of light from his third eye, um, um, Maitreya, who is the Buddha to come, was perplexed and said, what's going on? What's going on? And Manjushi was the one who explained what was then happening. And he also was symbolic of a relentless commitment to becoming awakened. He is one of the historical Shakyamuni's two attendants with uh, Samantabhadra. And uh, the uh, one thing I'd like to say about uh, this in general, and we've talked about this before, is a key to unlocking this chapter and any chapter is considering who is speaking and who is listening. Because all these beings, these Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, Arhats, etc., are all archetypes and role models. And they represent various strengths and weaknesses for all of us. And as such are examples of qualities that, that we all might aspire to have as we proceed with our practice. Now, chapter 14 um, <laughs> sure could in fact uh, be 
uh, potentially the most controversial and and confusing chapter in the Lotus Sutra, and uh, mostly because the language is seen as misogynistic and homo and transphobic in, in nature. Um, now, the first thing that we want to note is that this chapter was specifically directed to male monks. Um, so let's dive back into time. Let's take a little time travel trip if, if we could. And, and the Buddha did not come out uh, of his enlightenment uh, and start making rules. As, as Michael has said a few times, the Buddha began making rules, precepts in what's contained in the Vinaya. Um, as somebody did something uh, that was perhaps not commonsensical or was kind of silly or stupid, in fact, and he says, oh, gosh, you well, let's not do that anymore. So he'd make a rule. Um, so anytime someone did something unwholesome or unskillful, uh, a rule came out. And again, also, this was written 2000 years ago to male monks who lived in a cloistered monastic environment. One thing we can take from this is that we know that his followers made mistakes that just because you're practicing Buddhism doesn't mean you're perfect. And that uh, he occasionally had to address these and make a rule. And so doing so was actually a pretty big deal. At the time of the Buddha's death, um, Michael, correct me if my um, numbers here, I think there were about 160 ish rules that were in existence at the Buddha's death. Well, um, according to the Vinaya, <clears throat> there were and, and according to which Vinaya tradition, but I think uh, going by the Theravadan one, it's like 253 or 57. And then for nuns, there were over 300. Um, the number 160 comes from the fact that I think when the nuns order was founded, that's how many rules for nuns oh. are already in place. So you might remember me saying something like that. That's what I did. Okay, thank you. Right. Thank and then in, in the Dharmagupta Vinaya tradition that's used in East Asia, there were 250 uh, for monks around that number. And then again, there were like more for nuns, and I don't remember the exact number. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, so again, we're, we're on our time travel trip. And so clearly sexual abuse and sexual harassment was around back then. Um, and as that is today, um, men represent the majority of sexual abuse, assault, harassment, uh, you know, abusing their power. And we, of course, see that now we'll fast forward to today. We, we see this today in all facets of our lives, you know, the corporate world, um, different churches, particularly the Catholic Church, uh, the Boy Scouts, the military. And it happens in Buddhism too, uh, with a number of teachers having abused their role and power by having sexual relations with their students. Um, when I was working in the uh, corporate world in high tech, I worked at Intel, and every year we had to go through a one hour sexual harassment class every annually and an ethics class annually. Um, that's over 100,000 hours that Intel committed to its employees every year to go through sexual harassment training. And you know corporations wouldn't spend more than five or $6 million a year if it wasn't still a problem. So historically it's a problem and it's currently still a problem. Um, perhaps another way to look at chapter 14 is through this lens. If we rewrote chapter 14 with what we know today, considering all the different cases we have throughout corporations and churches and organizations, agencies, etc. I bet you it would carry a different message and it would be a little bit more uh, even across different um, genders and whatnot. Um, I also want to assure everyone that as we work toward uh, the Nietzsche and Buddhist Sangha of the San Francisco Bay Area International, our bylaws, which we will hopefully incorporate early next year, we have added a sexual harassment clause and we added a board level position to our board called a safeguarding officer, whose job it is to make sure that anybody at any time that feels uncomfortable has a place to go to report what they're feeling and have that be honored and represented and handled confidentially and carefully in a process based manner. So we want to make sure that we always protect this Sangha as we go forward. So then we ask ourselves. If this chapter is directed just to male monks, why do we have to pay attention to it? And as our time travel trip shows us, I think it is still relevant for today, although the language may be archaic and we could in fact have new language that's modernized, it's still interesting. Um, so what can we learn about this in 2021? Well, first of all, because of its surface language, 
it's easy to dismiss this chapter and create confusion and doubt the rest of the Lotus Sutra. So we don't want to do that. And this chapter actually encourages us to dive beneath the literal and seek the metaphoric, which of course has been a big theme of these presentations. Now, I'd like to say that once we take to heart the lesson that we have to be mindful and careful in how we treat other people, both from a sexual harassment perspective and from an ethical standpoint, that what is also underlying this chapter is in contained in the both the title of the chapter itself and Manjushri as a character. Mark, before we move on, can I, I, I wanna make a couple comments about the last slide. Yeah. Okay. Um, one, I wanna point out that, you know, a lot of people hear like 250 rules or 300 rules. A lot of these are real common sense things, uh, things that are already covered by our legal codes. And I would like to point out that our corporate standards, at least as written on paper, are actually stricter than the Venia, because you could do things according to the Venia that could be seen as harassment, you know, touching someone inappropriately or, or other things. And according to the written rules of the Venia, you would be put on probation, but in a corporate environment, you would just be fired. <laughs> now, really, and, and, and granted, um, you know, things on paper don't necessarily get enforced, and then you still have these um, hostile or toxic work environments. But at least on paper, I think corporate standards are stricter than the Venia. And the other thing I want to say, a question was raised about why do nuns have more rules? That is a whole nother topic. Um, one reason is because of the uh, patriarchal um, standards at that time, women were, were um, needed, well, in, in a, in a, they needed more protection for one. Uh, it was a lot more dangerous for women wandering then. And monks and nuns needed to wander into the villages for their food. And, um, you know, just to, to have a nun's institution at all was very radical in those days. So, you know, there's a whole, and we don't want to get into that right now. But, um, and as far as nature in Buddhism is concerned, since we don't really have monastic orders, uh, it's kind of moot. So I, but I did want to address that. And, and someday I will talk about Mahaprajapati and Yashadara in the founding of the nun's order and some things that Rita Gross, uh, who has written a book called Buddhism After Patriarchy, talked about. And it's well worth going into, but not today. Okay, sorry, go ahead, Mark. Uh, John uh, Martyr raised his hand. Um, so I want to get to that because this is actually a pretty big um, uh, break. This because I wanted to to use the Samantha Baja writing. I, did, on I, did, I, I didn't raise my hand for some reason. I've got a digital hand which has a mind of its own. So please excuse me. <laughs> okay, um, I kind of wanted to. No problem, John. I, I I wanted to get the elephant out of the room to use a pun, but a bump bump, um, so that we can move on to I think what's going on beneath the surface of this. But I you know if chapter fourteen is a very difficult chapter for for everyone, um, including myself. Um, I also want to just sort of as a side note say uh, this was the most difficult chapter for me to prepare for because I really dislike this chapter um, and it's always caused me um, problems and I stumble on it all the time and I ha Michael had to help me a lot so sensei thank you very much You're <laughs> this was this was a tough one um, okay let's let's now sort of uh, move beyond the fact that we want to be responsible. We also want to modernize our language and, and realize that 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 harassment and assault can happen from anybody to anybody at any time. It's very unwholesome and very unskillful. And again, to repeat, our commitment as leaders of this community is that we will create a safeguarding officer on our board of directors and make sure that we do everything we can to protect the integrity and safety uh, and sanctuary of, of this community. Um, all right, so moving into the more um, spiritual uh, viewing of this, um, chapter 14 uh, should be paired with chapter 13, uh, and uh, just like two wheels of, of a cart. And there's no contradiction between these two chapters. It's a I realize you don't have a slide up now, right? Oh, I... <laughs> okay, there we go. <laughs> um, um, all right, you guys are just going to put up with me today. It's been a... Um, yeah, anyways. No worries. All right, good. Okay, so there's no contradiction between the two chapters. It's really a matter of emphasis. Um, 
one is thinking about internal commitment and the other one is speaking to external action. And as we learned in chapter 13, Dharma is medicine and teaching is healing. Um, both chapters speak to our vow, uh, which is to do good, seek awakening and share the Dharma. And chapter 13, you know, tells us it's going to be very, very difficult. And chapter 14 encourages us to, you know, remain patient and gentle, calm, wise, compassionate, flexible, and never rash or aggressive. So no matter how hard it is, and sometimes when things get really hard, it can, you know, trigger us in many different ways, and we can get angry or whatnot. So, the, you know, chapter 14 is saying, hey, stay, you know, stay calm. Um, now, Daisaku Ikeda wrote in a book called The Wisdom of the Lotus Sutra, a discussion, volume three, on page 176, he said, quote, if peaceful practices is a discourse on method, then the immediately preceding encouraging devotion chapter is the explanation of our spirit, namely the spirit of not begrudging our life. And I think this is a nice way of reconciling chapters 13 and 14 and also saying, you know, we can learn from everyone uh, just because we're Nietzsche and Shu doesn't mean that we would cast aside other religious leaders, including Daisaku Ikeda. Oh, by the way, and just so you don't get heat for that, I'm the one who shared that passage with Mark and recommended it. <laughs> I, I think it was fantastic. Actually. Yo, I, I do, too. There's a lot of there's some good stuff in his dialogue and then a lot of stuff that I'm like, eh. but yeah. Yeah, so every now and then I'll share some gems from any source that I find with Mark that will help elucidate these chapters. Yeah, you know, as we did last week, we brought bodhisattvas in from all different walks of life. And I, I would also like to say that if it wasn't for Daisaku Ikeda, I wouldn't have met this practice. Um, so I have a deep, uh, a deep feeling of gratitude to him for that. That is true for me as well, yes. <clears throat> um, okay, so 14, chapter 14, peaceful and agreeable practices. Manjushri was the, you know, was the metaphor of being gentle. And, you know, and, and even though he's gentle, he carries a sword and he rides a lion. And so that's like <laughs> a really interesting kind of, you know, is that a dichotomy? What? Wait a second, is that a contradiction? But really, the takeaway, the main message of chapter 14 is equanimity, which is one of the four divine abodes. The title can also be translated as equanimity. Uh, now, just to list all the different uh, titles that come from all the different translations that I have, one was peaceful practice, one is ease in practice, one is a happy life, one is comfortable conduct, and the other one is safe and easy practices. And there's a hint in all of this is that the word practice and equanimity go together. I'm going to let just sort of sit with that for a second. Equanimity and practice go together. You get equanimity from your practice. So that's the big hint. You got to do something to get something. It's cause and effect. The cause is your practice. The effect is equanimity. And equanimity allows you to ride that lion with your sword of wisdom and cut through all delusions. And like this graphic shows, the waves of the sand don't actually hit the rock. The rock is equanimous. So looking at the external oh, message. Um, Mark, oh, oh, yeah. somebody's asking what is equanimity? And then I have another comment to make. Um, equanimity is uh, calm and stable and tranquil frame of mind, where no matter what is going on around you, you remain calm and stable. And from that place of calm, tranquil stability, you then can see, you can feel clearly, so you can let go of attachments, you can see clearly, you can respond to things going on around you in a positive and wholesome manner, and you can think clearly, which is acting with wisdom and compassion. And I just also telegraphed the four peaceful practices, which are all about your, um, your intention, your thoughts, your words, and your deeds, which as you all know from basic Buddhism is how you create karma or how you interact with the world through interdependence. Did that answer the question that was just asked? Okay. Um, yeah. Oh, and also I would add equanimity um, is, is the last of the four divine abodes that 
Mark has talked about many times before. So there's loving kindness where you want everyone to be well and happy. And then compassion when your loving kindness is directed to those who are having difficulties. Uh, sympathetic joy when it, loving kindness is directed toward those who are having successes, especially spiritual successes. And then equanimity, which is a, a loving kindness that's directed towards all equally, equa, equal. And also that is able to maintain that equal even mindedness no matter what the circumstances good or bad for you and others so equanimity is like the uh, fullest flowering of loving kindness in a sense um, also the question was asked why we're saying that the chapter 14 is directed at male celibates when it says how will bodhisattva mahasattvas be able to teach this sutra in ages to come and um, it's the reason why mark was saying this chapter is so difficult because the the first peaceful practice of includes who to approach and who not to approach. And who not to approach says a lot of things that don't make sense unless it were directed to a male monastic. And we should remember that Mahayana, many Mahayana sutras are assuming the Bodhisattva Mahasattvas, especially the advanced ones, will be monks. Or they could be nuns, but a lot of it is directed primarily to monks and you have to kind of extrapolate um, what that means for nuns laymen and lay women. So that's why we're saying that uh, it's directed to male monastics. It's, it all has to do with that first peaceful practice. Okay, sorry, go ahead, Mark. No, I thank you. And, and I, I think it's worth just taking a pause and remember that this was written 2,500 plus maybe years ago um, and a different world completely. And we should not take any of this stuff literally. Um, yeah. Actually, sorry to contradict you, but not that different because even now they're trying to reinstate, re, reinstate a nun's order in Southeast Asia, and that's been quite controversial and a lot of people resisting that. Um, so there are still many places where uh, Buddhism is practiced in a very patriarchal way, in a way that where the, the male monastics are held up as the, the ideal and everyone else comes in second. And fortunately in Nichiren and Shu, that is not our model. Um, you know, but as you said, this 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 uh, chapter fourteen was probably written no later than the one fifty common era, and you know it was a much more patriarchal world back then. It was just taken for granted that that's how things are, and we have to make allowances for that difference and adapt to uh, yeah. our values and our needs. Yeah, like we like we talked about you know, our little time travel, uh, and we will look back, but then we bring ourselves forward and we realize that it's still problem we still have sexism gender discrimination and racism you know it's it and, and it, it it haunts us and as i think i might have said last a couple of weeks ago i do look at where we are at as a species with a race between evolution and extinction um, we need to evolve into wholesome you know well thought wise compassionate beings otherwise we will all destroy ourselves and this is part of our big mission um, as buddhists is to share these teachings with others as much as we can so that more people chant more people meditate more people understand the um eightfold path and the six paramitas and the ethical teachings and, and awarenesses of the buddha and together we can, you know, we can grow into a beautiful place. We can bring light into the darkness, but it's an effort. That's what chapter 13 says. And we need to remain equanimous with equanimity. Right. That's what chapter 14 is telling us. Um, so again, let's not worry about the specificity of the language, but look beneath it for what it's telling us that Manjushri as a character is this role model of gentle, gentle person who is wise as the Buddha, riding on a lion, carrying a sword, and he is able to bring light into the darkness. And this is what Peaceful Practices chapter is telling us. So let's let's dive a little and, bit. And also, I, I can't recommend enough for anyone who's really concerned about this, uh, the book by Rita Gross called Buddhism After Patriarchy. I wrote it into the chat, and, and that's the book to read to really dive deep into these issues and, and how Rita Gross sees the ultimate principles of Buddhism is transcending any kind of uh, sexism uh, or misogyny or patriarchy or any of that. So, okay, go ahead. Michael, there's a, there's a technical term um, for this. The Lotus Sutra as a, as a religious text 
um, has themes that are woven throughout it. You'll find it in one chapter and then picked up again in another chapter and then woven back to the what was actually talked about in the first chapter and then carried forward into a, into a, into a future chapter. And think about motives. Uh, I forget how I forget what it was called, but there it's 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 you can't just read one chapter alone. You have to think about how this chapter relates to everything else, including remember we had the the three assemblies and the two different locations. We yeah. have like the historical and then the 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 the, the ultimate and then the historical and then the first half and the second half and all this kind of stuff going on. Yeah. But it, there's themes that are we're gonna revisit these themes as we go along. There's a lot of disjointed sections of the sutra because the sutra was compiled over like a couple hundred well maybe up to 300 years but uh whenever anybody added a part to the sutra they were doing it with an eye towards what was already there mm. right and with what was going on in other sutras and, and there was a lot of interplay so it it's uh it was really the genius of tian tai that looked at the whole structure of it as it had come to him through kamar jiva's translation yeah, and the reason the reason I point this out is that when you hit uh, uh, an obstacle or a, a block in any of the sutra, in any of the chapters or any of the verses, sometimes it helps to look backwards or forwards to see if you can find yes. out what's what's really going on, and and again to look deeper in, into into what what what's happening. You know, um, a good example is this: is a woman who was writing to Nietzsche and about you know, can we really go to the pure land of Amida Buddha through? Uh, the, practicing Lotus Sutra, and in chapter 23, it says, you know, and, and Natron is pointing there saying, you know, that's just a provisional idea that's used um, and, and um, to illustrate a point, but you have to look at the sutra as a whole. So this is something that Natron himself uh, is reminding people of in the Gosho from time to time to not just take little bits and pieces out of context, but look at the sutra as a whole and look at where the main point of the sutra is leading. Okay, so looking at um, chapter 14 guides us in how we engage the world, and it's very helpful, uh, again, to look forward to chapter 21, that we pair it with never despising bodhisattva, and how do we engage the world? Uh, never despising bodhisattva is held up as a model of shakabuku, uh, which is the, you know, more aggressive, assertive form of sharing. Um, but think about it. Doesn't never despising Bodhisattva actually conduct himself in accordance with both chapters 13 and 14? It might even be said that the Bodhisattva conducts himself in the same fourth right way, no matter what. Some react positively. In that case, he is living the peaceful practices. And in the other, he is abused and he must have endurance. But either way, the Bodhisattva is not to compromise the Mahayana, but always speak the highest teachings in a way that is peaceful, compassionate, and courageous. So peaceful practices, equanimity <laughs> means tranquil stability of mind in the midst of all activity. So that was a great question that someone asked earlier. <laughs> we actually we got a whole slide on it. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, Hui Shi, if I pronounce that right, uh, who was Jiri's teacher, Jiri was Tiantai, um, called this meditation without characteristics, meaning that we meditate anywhere all the time carried out in the course of whatever one is doing this is from jackie stone's two buddhas side by side and you guys have heard me say this all the time we don't chant and we don't meditate and remember meditating is chanting chanting is meditating um so we don't meditate to escape our lives we meditate to learn how to be equanimous strong powerful peaceful wise compassionate virtuous liberated we we do our practice to gain those benefits so that we can live in the world joyfully compassionately wisely fully liberated and fully engaged so this is what tian tai is saying here that through these peaceful practices we develop a meditation without characteristics so we our whole existence now becomes fully liberated and fully realized so that's what, what why we're doing okay um so i'm trying to catch up now uh okay um so the manjushri asked the buddha how the bodhisattvas should spread the teaching and the buddha explains in these four qualities that they should cultivate um 
and uh, I won't go into much detail because they're fairly self-explanatory, but it's this idea that it starts with our vow. So what is our basic intention? And then our thoughts and our words and our deeds and how we are, are trying to be calm and compassionate and wise and loving kindness and sympathetic joy and equanimous in all of our actions and interactions, not only with ourselves, but with those people around us. So these, you know, we, we try and be peaceful in how we approach things. And peaceful doesn't necessarily mean not speaking the truth, but it means that, as Michael has always said, we can disagree. We don't need to be disagreeable when we disagree. So there's ways that you can say and speak the truth. And as the Buddha said, right speech had four requirements to it. Was it true? Is it beneficial? Is it kind? And is this the right time? So we think of, we, we kind of bring these, these, these criteria to how we interact in life. Because as we talked about before, um, the quickest way to turn somebody off is to say, no, you're wrong. Uh, you know, and then you start an argument and, and nobody ever wins an argument. And if the goal is to evolve the human species so that we all become wise and compassionate and awake, then through skillful means, we have to ask ourselves, how can I speak the truth in a way that the person I'm talking to will be able to hear me and not become defensive and reactive in return? And of course, this is just tremendously difficult to do. Um, now, the other part of chapter 14 that was the first was like dealing in this way of who to consort with um, and how to conduct yourself in which we talked about is really like uh, 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 an early era sexual harassment clause from corporate training. Uh, the other part was ethics. Like how do we how do we react with people and this idea of, you know, do not consort with um, and what came out, uh, it was a great quote from Buddhism from today by Nikyo Nawano. He says, this does not mean do not approach or associate with someone. And Denise, I think you had actually picked up this and we talked about it right at the beginning and my compliments, because that really was the essence. It's not that we shouldn't consort or approach these people, but we got to be careful on how we do it. The true meaning is that we must not fawn over or idolize or idealize or compromise ourselves in dealing with them through excessive familiarity or for some ulterior motive or to curry favor. So the idea of Shakabuku and Shoju, um, these two chapters, 13 and 14, have created so much uh, disagreement in the Nichiren community is, you know, are we doing Shakabuku or Shoju? And from the Kaimoku show, a translation that Michael just did in his new book, Open Your Eyes, page 279, Quote, in this latter age of degeneration, there should be both embracing and subduing, embracing is shoju, subduing shakabuku, because there are lands of evil people as well as those of people who try to destroy the Dharma. Therefore, we have to know whether Japan today is a land of evil people or that of destroyers of the Dharma. And then another- uh, oh, Mark, uh, sorry, just, it's not page 70, not 279, it's section 279. Everything oh. is- is uh, broken down into like paragraph like parts. Thank you. Thank you. So yeah, they get confused if they tried to find it. I don't even think it has 279 pages. <laughs> okay, go ahead. So uh, and now here's, here's where this gets a little confusing and why things have gotten so confusing in Nichiren Buddhism. The Nyo Setsu Shugyo show says the present era is defined in the sutras as an age of quarrels and disputes when the pur pure Dharma will be obscured and lost. At this point, the provisional and true teachings have become utterly confused. When the time has come for the one vehicle to spread, the provisional teachings become enemies. If they generate confusion, they must be refuted from the standpoint of the true teaching. Of the two propagation methods, Shoju and Shakabuku, this is Shakabuku as it pertains to the Lotus Sutra. So we have this issue where interpretations of chapter 13 and 14 using Nichiren's Gosho have led to the fragmentation of the Nichiren tradition. This is really the pivotal trigger point where so many have misunderstood Nichiren and how fragmented the Nichiren tradition is since he passed and how easily it leads to fundamentalism and intolerance. I have long said that the problem with most Nichiren believers is they are trying to copy Nichiren without understanding his message, the history and the current context. 
And of course, recognizing that what worked in 1200 feudal Japan is not going to work in 2021. Stone and Lopez write in the Buddhist side by side about this that uh, Nichiren, you know, said we have to, you know, do shakabuku. Um, but this takes a lot of mental agility to unpack and remember the Buddha encouraging us to be flexible in mind. This is really important. Nichiren never left behind a single manifest or canon. None of his gosho are a unified whole. Uh, each gosho um, were written to specific people in specific circumstances and contexts, we can't take them as a whole and saying, okay, well, here's the orthodoxy within Nietzsche and Buddhism, because you can see in these two chap, these two quotes, there's, there's perhaps, con perhaps contradiction. I don't think there is contradiction, but there is, it is, if you look at it within a particularly orthodox fundamentalist kind of literal way, um, we can't take them as a whole, nor can we truly understand them without good working knowledge of the entire sutra all the sutras and the commentaries from Jiri, Myole, and Dengyo. And we can find many contradictions from the Goshos. Uh, so what do we use as a tiebreaker? I don't, you know, this is, this is hard. This is why, you know, we try and hold these study sessions. Another significant thing to notice is that never despising Bodhisattva is held up. Oh, wait, said that right, sorry. Um, you can say it again, that's an important point. <laughs> Never despising Bodhisattva is held up as a role model of Shakabuku, but he never really is harsh. You know, he's always he's he's always peaceful in how he does it, um, and he lives these peaceful practices himself as compassionate and courageous. Now, the deeper understanding of Nichiren's view could be found in the Ongi Kuden, which is the orderly transmitted teachings, and where he says, "quote When one is refuting." one should not use the provisional teachings in an attempt to enlighten that particular person. So he's saying, use the Lotus Sutra as your guide, uh, but still be peaceful. And while he rejects the four practices uh, in certain goshos, he doesn't reject virtues as patience, gentleness, calm mind, wisdom, compassion, uh, to be flexible, gentle, compliant, never aggressive. His own methods were a model of dignity and respect even when he was pointing out errors. We use the same as his, you know, so his, it's as similar to his stance on practicing the precepts, thinking that people who thought that they could become enlightened by practicing the precepts, he said, no, he always acted in accordance with them. He simply said, one should not realize Buddhahood by practicing them, but we should, okay, who's, okay, so got, hang on a second. Zero, you gotta stay on mute. Um, uh, we should, uh, we should never be disagreeable in disagreeing, and we can look to this chapter for guidance on how to conduct ourselves while remaining steadfast in our conviction of the Lotus Sutra's superiority. And again, as we have learned, the Lotus Sutra does not reject prior teachings, it recontextualizes them, revealing their full, perfect, complete meaning. Speak the one vehicle, but do it with wisdom and compassion with the thought of how do I phrase this so that this person across from me next to me can hear it without becoming defensive. Never compromise the content, but do it in a mindful, skillful method. And again, the title gives us the key to unlock this entire chapter, equanimity in the midst of life, no matter what is going on. So what does this chapter mean to us? First, remain equanimous in all things. Remain steadfast, hold firm. That's chapter 13, of course. Have confidence in the jewel of the lotus. Cultivate patience, gentleness, a calm mind, wisdom, and compassion through the four practices. Be flexible, gentle, never rash or aggressive. And everything that we discussed today is contained in the meditation container mantra, Namu Myo Horenge Kyo. So hopefully learning more about the meaning and intent of chapter 14 will make you want to chant more. I was because I was going to close with who is the tiebreaker? You. If this practice works, you will become wise. You will become compassionate. You will become loving, kind, and compassionate, and sympathetic, and equanimous. It will. It will happen. It, it's impossible that the prayers of the practitioners of the Lotus Sutra will ever fail. That's what that means. You know, it's not that you're going to have a 
beautiful life without any problems, but it's going to mean that you're going to be awake through everything, good, bad, and neutral. You know, the agony of grief and the ecstasy of joy, you know, you're just going to feel it and it's going to be great because you're awake no matter what. So you are the tiebreaker. And then to get there, it's practice. That was the whole thing. It's your practice is the cause. The effect is equanimity. And equanimity is a real superpower. It's amazing. And that's why we practice to do it. I will close with perhaps one story. It might be slightly apocryphal or <laughs> um, maybe twisted up in my, my crazy brain. But I heard Michael at one point, you said something, you know, Dogen retired to the mountains. Uh, he was he was active for a while and you know and then he said i gotta go i'm going to the mountains this is this 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 is too hard you know, unless unless you live a monastic ex 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 life alone and sequestered forget it um i think that's what you said michael right yeah, in fact it, part of it was that tendai monks were trying to drive him away from the from the capital <laughs> but, but so he, he says wow this enlightenment stuff it's it's too hard unless you're a monastic i'm you know just go to the mountains and retreat Nietzsche never quit on the common people. And he said, chant Daimoku and you will become awake. You will realize the pure land in this body. So to me, it's another validation that Nietzsche was just an amazing, wonderful person, you know, superior practice, our founder. And that's why this practice is phenomenal. But the last thought is we don't reject anything we take to heart that the daimoku on our gohan as michael says the the, the daimoku namu myoho renge kyo illuminates everything and as that's our compass we can navigate anywhere we want to go because we have the light of namu myoho renge kyo acting as our compass yeah all right